Welcome to the final episode of the Goldshaw Farm podcast for 2023, and we've got a very special episode worked up for you today. You know, earlier this week on our YouTube channel, I put out a video where I spelled out exactly how much money our farm made from farm operations in 2023. But without further ado, let's get into the numbers. So to start things off for 2023, in terms of farm revenue, it was up this year. and It was the highest revenue we've ever generated at $25,282. And so if you're looking for the grand total of what did Goldshaw Farm farm operations produce in 2023, it ends up being $17,929.85. But as you guys might recall from a few episodes ago, I had a conversation with a viewer by the name of Karina, who had some really specific feedback about how I did those videos. There were red flags right away. Where's all the money coming from? You add new things to the farm, but not to scale. Because if he's not doing it to scale, if he's not making enough money, but he bought a really super expensive tractor brand new with all the fixings. I've never known a farmer to do that, by the way. <laughs> and she wanted more depth. She wanted more detail. You know, since I've been doing these longer podcasts where they can be like an hour or even two hours, I'm going to probably make a podcast follow up and I might even use a clip of us talking here for it. Um, I like that like, idea. And so in today's episode, I'm going to be giving you guys exactly that. We're going to be diving a little bit deeper in the numbers. We're going to be talking a little bit about how I make some kind of choices and decisions around how I actually structure some of those numbers. And I actually have a conversation with my friend, John Siskovich, talking about the farm business and how to think about farm businesses in general so that anybody who's out there ever dreaming about having a farm business of their own really trying to give you some practical things that we think about as we think about various farm businesses that we've had. And John, if you guys aren't familiar, he is a wicked, wicked smart guy. He's a very talented farmer. He's a very talented farm marketer. He has a company called Farm Marketing Solutions where he'll do uh, like books and consulting. And probably John's biggest claim to fame is he is the inventor of probably the most commonly used chicken tractor design out there these days. I have a six foot by 10 foot shelter is the size of the chicken tractor. That's 60 square feet, six times 10. Get your copy of Threat Free Chicken Tractor Plans, build your chicken tractor, raise your chickens, eat your chickens, and then decide for yourself. For those of you guys who are not familiar, a chicken tractor is a structure that you can use to house particularly broiler chickens, like when you're raising them. Um, you know, you want to kind of keep them in one spot. And chicken tractors are really nice because they can keep your birds safe and protected. And you can just kind of pick it up and move it with the birds inside it over the course of a summer. And so every single day you can just move your chickens to fresh pasture. That is the beauty of the chicken tractor. I've even used chicken tractors to raise ducks and geese before. And now traditionally, Joel Salatin, who a lot of folks are familiar with, he's a farmer down in Virginia. He actually has a kind of like a basically like a very low style chicken tractor that's out there which might be the only other one that I could say could give John a run for his money in terms of uh, kind of wide adoption and usage at this point. But John came in and invented this style of chicken tractor that looks a little bit more like a house. And it's incredible because what's nice about it is you can actually walk inside of it. It's really versatile. It's really functional. And like, so John is the guy who invented that too. And so that might be where you know that name Siskovich from. Well, anyway, I sat down with John to talk about my farm business, how to think about farm businesses in general, and really dive deep into the books of Goldshaw Farm. I'll also be dropping into the conversation occasionally just to offer you guys some answers to questions that you had to the video I put out earlier this week as well. So I'm trying to give you as much information in one episode as humanly possible. The advice that I've given to hundreds and hundreds and so many people at this point is to start slow, grow it the way it wants to be grown, that your business is going to tell you where, where, what direction it wants to go in. And uh, yeah, you're doing it. So I, I think your numbers look awesome this year for the mix that you've created for what your goals are. I, I appreciate you saying that, but I guess here's, here's the nagging feeling I've had with it <laughs> of like, gosh, shouldn't I be doing more? Shouldn't I be expanding more? Shouldn't I be growing more and scaling up? And like, if I look at my year this year versus last year, I feel like I phased out a couple of things. And so I feel like I'm getting a little bit more efficient, but I haven't really scaled up. It is a very common mistake when people start uh, farming, homesteading, farmsteading uh, to take on too much at once. And you split your time, you split your energy, and you're going to split your resources, um, both finances and, and your time and just how much energy you have to put into something. 
So part of scaling up is scaling back other operations and identifying what are the things you're doing because you want to do, irregardless of how financially profitable, viable they are. And what are the things that you could take A or B and you're going to keep A because it's more profitable than B and you can have either one. It's actually, I think, a little poisonous to when you talk about farming to drive scale really fast and have that be a focus uh, because that's where a lot of people's I've seen too many people burn out uh, in, in, in pretty dramatic ways uh, that I would never suggest push scale, push harder, do more. You'll figure out how to make the balance work. And uh, what we're going to dig in today's episode is the numbers around that. And how do you make that work for your mix? Honestly, the cautionary tale that I've seen happen over and over again, which has always driven how I've done the farm since like when I first started things back in 2018, was seeing and hearing kind of the stories of people trying to go bit too big too quick. That was like the thing that always scared me. Like I can even th- I can even actually think back to a video that you made. I want to say it was like 2016, maybe 2017, something like that, um, yep. where you were just like, I've been so stressed. This is like so much because you were at that point, like with your farm, you had, you know, you're doing chickens, pigs. I think you were doing sheep. You had turkeys. I think like like hops, apples. You remember, like, what? And I was starting. Yeah. Brewing. Yeah. I, hops. And a yeah. uh, half acre <laughs> vegetables, you know, for folks who aren't familiar with that. Can you kind of bring that to life? Because I think that's a it, it, it is an interesting and I don't mean to put you out there as a cautionary tale, but it is an interesting place to start from. So I would definitely use me as a cautionary tale where I got into it and I had some outside investment to help grow the farm. And we, I said yes to so many things. My, that was my favorite word in the beginning was yes. You want to do this? Yeah, we got it. You want to do this? Yeah, we'll do that too. Oh, it seems like a good, how, how, how hard could that be? You know, it's just gardening. It's just raising a couple of sheep. It's just unjust, unjust. But to do it effectively and efficiently, you make a lot of mistakes. And what I love about your path that you've done, and I'll go back to me in a second, uh, you're you're doing that that slow growth. You're learning. You're taking those lumps. You're figuring out what works for you financially and what works for you, you know, kind of spiritually, what you like to do on the farm. So when I began, there was a year where I had sheep, pigs. Uh, broilers, layers, I had 2,500 broilers, 400 uh, egg-laying flock, a um, couple dozen pigs. I was managing a 52-acre property. We were setting up a brewery, and I was helping out with that, too, where we had the initial expansion and, and uh, growth of the brewery. So there was setting things up, developing markets, um, going to dinners to meet people and shake hands and go into farmer's markets. And I did a couple markets, um, and I had some employees in the beginning, and then you're managing people too. And for every person hour that you spend together, there's time apart where you have to set up tasks for them, manage them, set up the resources that they need to survive in that position. And all of that is a lot to take on. I had some partners in this. Uh, some were part-time, some were full-time. One was managing the brewery at the time. Another one was only part-time. So, and then there's the developing the communication between your partners. And if it all sounds like a lot, because it's a lot. And I wasn't a, I didn't grow up in a farming family. Uh, this was career number, I don't know, three for me. And uh, it just, it was too, too much, too fast. And I flared out and just had the breakdowns. It almost was like a yearly event sometime in late August where you're in the back pasture with a hose run over your head, uh, just like shaking your head, like, why, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know? And uh, it was th- through those hard lessons that I, I scaled back and figured out the mix that works for me. Well, and, and, and like I said, it was sort of seeing some of that, like your stuff and talk, you know, a couple other people's, I don't mean to just say it's you, but like that has always left this impression in my mind as a new beginning farmer and wanting to scale up and start like always being cautious about that. And even without totally going full bore, I've had, yeah, pretty much every September I'm like exhausted and just so ready to butcher birds and be done and like <laughs> like all right i'm done all right like because you always hit this like yeah it's like late august into september like like wow it just drains you and then it isn't until like at least for me here like by like mid-october when i reduce my number of birds and things get simpler and i'm starting to move animals into kind of their winter setups does it start to feel like oh it chills and now like you know as we're recording this in december you know 
my farm activities like on a daily basis amount to about 30 minutes or so. It's like, I, yeah. I almost feel like I don't get enough time with the animals and like have to force myself, like, you know, find opportunities to just like hang out in there to spend the time that I enjoy. And, and that's always kind of a nice place to be because it like, it recovers you. But then I know by like next September again, I'm going to be in the same place. So take the whole conversation about making your farm viable, making your homestead viable, making money through agriculture, and then realize after you've taken that step back that 99.9% of people in agriculture have some outside income. They have a job in town. Their spouse or partner has a job in town. There's some secret sauce that makes the whole thing work. So when you look at Morgan's numbers, you don't say, well, Morgan's the guy on the internet saying that, you know, this is what you do and then you can do this full time because that's the, that's the dream for some of us. Right. And for others, it's something that we want to do as part of our life. So I would already call your farm a success because you're happy. You're living a healthy life and you're, you're finding balance in what you do. And no one's you're not going to, you know, fast forward. You've passed away and people are standing around your funeral and my mentor uh, Troy says this to me all the time. No one's going to stand around in your funeral and go, man, he could work. That guy could work. <laughs> you know, that's not, that doesn't have to be a defining feature of you. You, you have this artistic expression through your media and that's a, that's a product on your farm. It's listed in your, in your P and L, your high level P and L there. And that balance is going to be somebody's job in town, some other work that they do to help supplement their farm. And what you're doing is offsetting your food costs, creating a lifestyle for yourself that you f feel successful and fulfilled in. And you're sharing this information so that the, the crux of the conversation here is not to the dollar how, how financially viable any one operation is, but how Morgan has made it work so that he wants to do it again next year. You know, that's a really interesting angle that I, I don't. I don't think about it in those terms, but I think I've probably accidentally fallen into that where it's like, yeah, how do you keep farming without starting to hate farming? And, <laughs> I, you know, I think on the surface, that seems like a really dumb statement. But I think for most folks who've been doing it for a little while, it's like, oh, yeah, no, that's that's definitely a consideration for sure. Well, familiarity breeds content. Yeah, anything you do long enough, you're going to grow to dislike parts of it, at least not every part of farming is glorious in what you see on YouTube. There's some really real stuff that happens that's pretty pretty emotionally brutal. And um yeah, you have to you have to find that mix because if you're prepared for that, all the difficulty that comes with farming and then it's your job, or do you really want to do this because it looks fun and you like gardening and keeping a few birds and cows are like the coolest ever and pigs are really smart and fun. So like you can get a taste of it. And then work your job or you can make it your full-time job and there's a path, but whether you're trying to do it part-time or full-time, not having a handle on your numbers is a guaranteed recipe for failure. Yeah. So, so well, let's talk a little bit about that because, because I think that's been something that I've always tried to prioritize just, you know, tracking various things in spreadsheets and then, then at the end of the year or the end of the month, depending on what I'm tracking, like going in and sort of truing that up. So it's not a total mess by the time I'm trying to do my full year-end picture but like what sort of tools have you traditionally used to like kind of keep tabs on like here's what i'm spending here's what i'm making and here's the financial picture of my farm for sure and that's a great question and the answer may or may not surprise you <laughs> um especially if you have to work with somebody else on a farm nothing beats a pencil and paper i i'm a very analog guy i like to do I, I do a lot on the internet, I, 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 all the things, um, but I really appreciate writing in a notebook, uh, having tracking sheets in the coop. Where, where are you taking actions on your farm that are critical to the success or failure based on what your inputs are and have some way to write it down at that point. You're not going to remember it and go back to the house and write it down. You may not have service on your cell phone. Your hands may be covered in stuff that you don't want to handle your phone with which is very common in livestock, especially, but even gardening or farming uh, vegetables, uh, your hands are dirty. And sometimes you can't even, you're so dried out that you can't get your phone to read your hands. So having some way where you can pick up a pencil uh, and write it down, because then you can take a picture of that tracking sheet and then pull up the picture on your desktop right next to Excel, Google Sheets, QuickBooks, Xero, 
whatever you use uh, as your accounting software, and then transfer from your written notes into your digital record keeping so it's easier to keep that over time and kind of aggregate and then analyze that information. But I, I love writing stuff down. There's no beating it. Yeah, I mean, and, and I will admit for me, you know, I actually do it more into my phone, but the the difference is I actually do it mostly as text-to-speech these days. Okay. And so, like, I'll just smash it. I have a button I can just smash on the side of my watch and, like, make the note. And then at the end of the day, when I'm just, like, usually doing my other organization stuff, usually I'm just kind of grabbing those notes too. And, like, it, it kind of amounts to being the same thing because I think you're right that, like, trying to track it in directly into, like, an Excel spreadsheet while you're doing something is just a nightmare and then trying to like be in a place where you're going to remember to do it at the end of each day is also a nightmare and so having some sort of record that you can then just true up a couple times a week is so much easier oh for sure for sure i mean the faintest ink is better than the sharpest memory if you don't write it down it doesn't exist and as you get better at this it the whole thing becomes an exercise of leaving yourself breadcrumbs of taking pictures, taking notes, and putting them in a way where they're time stamped, where you can access that information later, later when you're scratching your head, wondering what went on, and then setting reminders or due dates. Like you go to the dentist, you go to the doctor, you get your oil changed in your vehicles, or you change your oil every so many miles. We know how to set dates in a calendar, set a date to sit down and just enter the stuff in to begin with, you know? And as you get more comfortable and you repeat doing it, then you'll get better at it and you'll know what to look for and you'll have that information to work with. But if you don't write anything down in the first place, it's all guesswork. And then you're going to say, no one can make money off of farming. Well, how much money did you make? Well, I think I made this. I don't know. <laughs> oh, completely. Well, and, and I guess this is another thing I will say that I have learned from you and stolen shamelessly from you in terms of how I track, not just like my chickens, but really every part of my business. Like, you know, for, for folks who don't know this, John has a, you know, essentially a digital product that he created called the Pastured Poultry Packet, and some, even not digital too, you can get a physical version of it. And and what's really cool about it is it gives you kind of like spreadsheets and tally sheets and like really all of the things you would need to like basically do pastured poultry as a business. And then for me, using that, I've just like taken that framework and applied it to whether I'm doing meat geese or trees there's like a lot of things that carry over in terms of how to think about it. So like, where did that idea come up from for you? Like, where did that come from? Uh, part of that, uh, and thanks for, <laughs> thanks for bringing it up. Uh, part of that came from, uh, YouTube questions and answering comments and wanting to, when we think about scale, how do I scale the information? If I, if you said this on a podcast recently, if you sat there and answered every YouTube comment religiously, that is a full-time job plus you would just answer comments all day long and give out what is essentially free consulting. And I, I, there is a world where I would love to clone myself and do that. So to clone myself and do that, I create, I wrote it all down. Everything that I struggled with, every decision that I had to make that pasture poultry packet. Number one is the unit economics for what does it cost you to raise one broiler chicken? And then you can take that number because you've done the exercises and scale it from there. And after you yep. raise the couple, you'll say, I can more efficiently do this. John's wrong here. I can do this better. And that's great. You know, we are who our students grow beyond. And I want people to look back and say, man, John's stuff is so basic, you know, but I have to give us a starting point. Well, and, and, and I think I think that that's important for like anybody who's like thinking about trying to raise and, and you know, my experience sits with mostly animals for profit, right? Like if you're trying to do that where you're not losing money year after year after year, or at least know if you're not losing money, like being able to track that data and then being able to make assumptions really plays into it. I think the the best example I have, have of that is like, you know, this year I raised pigs for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. And it was three pigs. I had no idea what it was going to cost me. I had no idea what I would net out in terms of me, like anything about it. I was just like, I'll figure this out. I'm not... You know, I spent, let's see, uh, about 450. I spent less than $1,000 to get the operation going, plus uh, maybe 13, 1400 when I include the feed into the mix. So I didn't yeah. feel like I was throwing out so much money that it was going to break me or ruin anything. Like it's, if it, if it comes bad, it's a, you know, bad choice, but not the worst thing. And so I went at it. But now I'm seriously considering for next year doing, you know, raising half and whole hogs for, 
like, you know, part of the farm business. And I have this data from my experience this past year that's going to drive everything from when I'm trying to sell people and say, well, okay, would you like to buy this? I'm going to be charging five fifty a pound for a half a hog, $5 for a whole hog. Like, is that something you're up for? Like, I'll be able to like do that without knowing and having a pretty good sense of if I'm going to lose money or make money based on my numbers from this year, which like that's where that data comes into play right away. So I'm just going to take a moment here to bust in on my conversation with John to answer a few questions that popped up after I posted the regular YouTube video talking about how much money our farm made this year. And if you guys are listening to the audio only version of this podcast, uh, just go to the Goldshaw Farm YouTube channel and you'll be able to find the video of, I think it's called How Much Money Our Farm Made in 2023. And it breaks down all the numbers, which I gave you a little bit of the teaser for at the beginning, but that's what I'm referring to here. So one question that popped up was specifically around allocation. Like, how do I take all the different expenses that the farm has and allocate it to different things? So like when you're looking at my various spreadsheets, I'm often showing that there's like a infrastructure cost, for example. And usually what that is, is me taking all of the expenses related to that activity, plus a portion which I usually do as pro rata percentage of revenue generated that gets allocated as well. And, and, and yes, I know that that sounds very jargony, but that's kind of what you guys ask for in this podcast episode. So let me get there. So specifically, I'm just going to use the geese as an example. When you look at the expense line item, whether it's the 165 for goslings or 506 for live geese or the $3,600 for Uh, meat geese, all those things, the $1,000 for fertilized goose eggs. What I'm essentially doing is taking like all of the associated costs to say feed my geese and house my geese. And like that goes into that number. Then it gets divided up um, based on a percentage of the revenue generated from that activity. But then it's also in taking into account a lot of other things related to the farm. So for example, taxes on our land get allocated out to the geese as a business as well. But remember, there's a lot of different things that are defraying that that tax and that expense. So, you know, the cattle take a portion of that. The geese take a portion of that. The trees take a portion of that. The value-added products take a portion of that. The YouTube ad revenue or even the dollars that I generated from selling like a, a Goldshaw Farm hat, like all of those things each take a portion of the taxes that are owed on our farm on an annual basis. And, and so, like, that's how I'm paying for that. But the percentage that gets allocated is driven by the size of the revenue. And since, as I've said before, there's significantly more revenue that comes in from, say, social media content, that social media content is paying a much, much larger percentage of my tax bill than the geese are, for example, because the revenue from YouTube is significantly higher than the revenue from geese. And when I say this allocation model, I know that that might sound very complicated in, like, accountant jargony. But the concept and principle behind it is actually very, very straightforward and simple. So, for example, let me illustrate this for you. Let's say you had three friends who all go out to eat dinner one night. And they decide that the way they're going to split their bill is based on how much each of them makes on a weekly basis. And so, say one person is making $500 a week. The other person is making $200 a week. And the, the third person is making $300 a week. Now you've got these three friends who all go out to eat and, you know, one of them makes as much as the other two combined. And so when they get their bill for their dinner, the bill for the dinner ends up being $100 and they decide that the one who makes the $500 a week is going to pay $50. The one who makes um, $200 a week is going to pay $20. And then the one who makes $300 a week pays $30 because again, it's a portion of what their weekly income is. And yes, I know for 2023, the numbers in that example are ridiculously low. I'm just doing it so that I can do the math in my head on the fly while talking to you guys. But my point is just a matter of taking how much they generate in terms of revenue, and they're basically paying a percentage of that. When it comes to my farm businesses, I'm doing exactly the same thing when it comes to infrastructure costs. Like when I think about paying my insurance or paying my taxes, unless it's an activity directly associated with that part of the farm. Like for example, the goose feed that I actually have to give the geese, all of that gets 100% allocated to the geese. But when it comes to something like the cost of the hoop coop, 
that was something that got defrayed across a number of different business activities between the geese, the ducks, the chickens, and even thinking about things like YouTube. And so, yeah, that actually makes my operating costs for certain portions of the farm much lower. But as I think about where do I stick some of these expenses and think about the shape and size and structure of my business, it's the only kind of logical and, and fair way to look at it. I mean, if you look at most corporations and how their bookkeeping works and how they think about cost allocations for various businesses, it's completely the same model that I'm applying here. So for example, say you have a company that has like corporate brand and advertising and they're doing marketing for the company as a whole, but they have several lines of business, they're often allocating the expense of that corporate overhead across those lines of businesses. And usually that, that allocation is driven as a percentage of revenue or maybe like size or number of customers. Like the way you allocate it out can be done a number of different ways, but either revenue or net income are the most common models that are used for allocation. Hey, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, this one would really geek out and get like in the weeds. And so I hope you guys are getting that in the weeds thing. Yeah, I'm just a love machine and I don't work for nobody but you. Now, another question that's popped up when it comes to thinking about the farm business and like the social media impact specifically, a lot of folks would say, well, you know, all of your sales are derived from your YouTube channel or people who are watching your videos. And, and I do believe that that is probably about 90% true. I mean, there's a couple of folks locally here around our farm who might be purchasing our products, but for the most part, you're, you're 100% right. But also recognize that that was a strategic choice I made from day one, where the whole reason I even started making videos in the first place was because I wanted to have a way to market my farm products. And yeah, I could go the traditional route or work a farmer's market, or I could try to like, you know, I don't know, find a distributor for my products. Like there's a number of ways that I could do it, I chose to use the power of the internet to sell my products, given that it, it was, you know, 2018 when I was starting, but even now in 2023 and even beyond, that seems like a decision that makes sense. And yes, I know that that is unconventional and that is not the traditional, but that's just me simply managing my business the right way. The time that I put into making videos kind of would have been spent going to farmer's markets and it was just my strategic choice to say, hey, let me build my farm business this way versus having to spend, you know, a day or two at a farmer's market each day and have to load up for the farmer's market each day and, and all of that stuff. And so I, I hear people when they say that, and it, it often kind of comes across as a little bit of a dig. But when it comes down to it from my perspective, like, yeah, that was by design. And I don't see that that is a strike against me and my farm. I just see that as a strategic decision that I made. And for anybody starting a farm or thinking about starting a farm, I think the question of how you're going to distribute your products, I think the question of how are you going to set the prices of your products, I think how are you going to tap into various customer markets, like that should be like a core part of your thinking from day one when you're starting a farm. I think so often folks are, are zeroing in on this idea of, hey, let me go out there and start raising this thing. Like I really love to work with cattle, so I wanna just start raising cattle and that's how I'm gonna start my farm business without thinking about, well, how are you gonna sell the cattle? What are you gonna do with those cattle? Like, how's it all gonna work? Like, I think if you're not doing that, you're doing a poor job in planning your farm and you're missing one of the most basics and fundamentals, arguably not the most basic and the most fundamental. And so. Yeah, I hear that criticism, but I kind of slough it off a little bit because when it comes down to it, how you distribute is a strategic choice. And that was a strategic choice I made for the farm business really from day one. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. A really kind and supportive comment that I felt like I saw a lot consistently on the How Our Farm Made Money video was specifically around why do I feel like I need to share this information? I don't owe this information to anybody and I shouldn't feel like I have to share it. And, and I appreciate when people say that and, and I agree with them very much to a certain extent, but I do put an asterisk around it because I, I feel like, and I, and I feel like I see this a lot in social media in general, like in the homesteading space, very specifically in the farming space, oftentimes too, more generally, 
is that when you see people out there creating content and showcasing their lives and saying, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm living my life. Take a look. Isn't it great? And people follow along with you. Oftentimes when you're doing that, you might be inspiring other people to do that same very thing. In fact, you know, like as I'm sitting here talking to John Siskovich, he was one of those folks who actually was a motivation for me back in the day. You know, back when I was still working an office job and living in Washington, D.C. and dreaming of one day having a farm, he had a podcast that I used to listen to all the time when I was commuting out to Bethesda. And it was in some of the things that he said that really helped educate me, stoke that fire of me wanting to start a farm and really motivate me. And so think about that role and that power that creating content and social media can have and how that can influence people. I feel like you really do have a responsibility when it comes to that sort of thing to be open and to share exactly kind of what does the shape of your business look like. I don't mean like you have to share absolutely everything. And I actually have found over the years that having boundaries and saying, hey, this is where my boundary is. And then ensuring that folks respect that is actually super, super important. But I also feel like doing things like revealing the farm operations income is important so that I don't give people this distorted picture that you can say, hey, you can have a dozen cattle and handful of ducks and geese and you can make it all work because I don't want anybody ever to walk away with that impression, much like I don't want folks to walk away with the impression that I'm an expert in something. I'm just simply a guy out here living my life, running my farm, making videos, and really try to enjoy the time I have here on this planet, as well as maybe try to make this place just a slightly little bit better place. And so because of all of that, I personally believe that I do have a a responsibility to talk a little bit about the financial side of things. But that said, I'm going to still draw hard lines. And again, I know I saw it over and over again in the comments on the How the Farm Made Money video. I have zero plans to disclose my social media income. I have zero plans to disclose income from, say, how much I made from the book or how much I make from T-shirts or anything like that. And as I've said before, it's for a couple of reasons. One, and probably the biggest reason, it's that strategic choice that I feel like it puts me at a competitive disadvantage when I'm negotiating with sponsors or if I'm negotiating uh, for certain partnerships and, and that sort of thing. And, and so to kind of put that data out there, I don't think behooves me or helps my farm in the least bit. And so, yes, that is a boundary that I have and a boundary that I will continue to maintain. I don't know, guys, just keep that in mind. Now, one comment made by, I, I believe you say her name, uh, Christy Terry, that I actually, I really appreciated and hadn't even thought about it this way, but Seeing her comment has completely changed my thinking on this one. You know, I made the point in the How My Farm Made Money to say, hey, I'm I'm changing how I classify the ducks and the chickens in my farm business, and I'm taking it out of the farm operations P&L because at this point, from a farm operations standpoint, it doesn't make sense for me to raise these animals. I I said that, and I still stick by that, but but the point that Christy made— or Christy Terry made that that really sticks with me, and I'm going to keep this in mind, is that you know the benefit of the ducks and the chickens isn't just what they bring from a bottom line, but the impact that they have on the overall farm ecosystem, and and they're a hundred percent right about that one. I mean, when it comes down to it, and you know I've, I've talked about this a lot, you know I really do try to manage my farm like an ecosystem as a whole, and to have a good healthy ecosystem, you need a diversity of animals, you need a diversity of plants, and you need all those things to be working together. And the chickens and ducks absolutely do help the diversity of the farm ecosystem that we have here, where they help balance things out. I mean, the chickens are probably the best example of it, right? Where I have the chickens following the cattle in the summer months because the cattle are always getting covered in flies. And while they don't entirely solve the fly problem, the chickens make a significant impact in the fly problem. And so they are helping the farm ecosystem. They also do a great job of taking the manure that the cattle will leave out there and spreading it all over the farm. And so, yeah, I I think you're absolutely right about that one, Christy Terry. and, And I will keep that in mind as I'm thinking about a lot of my farm decisions. And that is honestly part of the challenge of trying to like break out a line by line farm operation at times because it really forces you to look at things as individual pieces versus how all the parts work together as a whole ecosystem. All right, now let's get back to my conversation with John. Creating your own information that's relevant to you is going to be critical because you'll you'll listen to interviews like this. You'll 
talk to people and get some of their numbers. But until you put those numbers within your context, they're, it's never the picture's never going to fully develop. And I love that you brought up two things here. Uh, well, I mean, so many. One, capturing the information and using it. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, another one, broiler chickens, pigs, good one-year operation. In and out, on the books, you know what happened that year and you started with something and you ended with something, then it's done. It's in the freezer, right? And that's a that's a cleaner, easier route to take where then you get into multi-species and you add in cows where you invest one year with a longer term play out where you're growing them one year and harvesting in another year. And how do you tie that out in your books is a, another another challenge as we get into analyzing which farm operations are most beneficial to our whole picture. Part of it is the animal type, but then I think the other difference is, are you breeding or are you just raising? So mm -hmm. like in your examples there, right? If you're just doing feeder pigs, which is like what I did this past year, where I'm getting piglets at like eight weeks old and I'm raising them until, you know, five months, four, four and a half months, like depending when sort of slaughter is. And yep. like, it's a very narrow window and all my cash outlays happen in that window. And then at the end of that, if I'm selling it, I'm getting the cash pretty quickly from it. And so yep. it's not like a long turnover. The cattle thing, like I still don't have the greatest handle on what the picture is and how I think about going from, you know, losing $20,000 to saying, oh, I'll, I'll probably make, you know, some money or after year like six, like here's mm -hmm. how I know that that's going to be the case. And then I have all these assets on the book on top of it. So it's probably even technically making more because I have more value in the farm. Like yep. that's a very complicated thing to consider for anybody thinking about like how to manage that farm. And so like having that mixture of businesses too, I feel like, especially if you're starting out, like start with the cash flowing ones and don't be too reliant on the multi-year ones like trees and cattle, which take, you know, maybe a decade to really make sense for you financially. Well, and in the beginning, uh, measured risk. Don't take on anything where it can't 100% go wrong and you go under. You know, if you're taking on a new farm operation, whether you're just starting out or if you've been doing it and you're feeling like maybe I'll add on pigs this year, if if four grand for pigs is the risk, be prepared to eat four grand. Hopefully you do better than that. You should do better than that. It's great. But livestock especially find lots of creative ways to die before you actually want them to. Uh, and you have to do some worst case scenario in your farm planning that if you're, you're doing it just for your family, for meat, you have to realize that, you know, this could go south. Um, and if you are to the point where you've been farming for years and you're going from 200 pigs to 250 pigs at that point, you kind of know what the risk is and know what you're doing. And you know, that, you know, pigs in means pigs out, you know, in the investing world, right. There's the concepts of alpha and beta. So, so the alpha being that sort of upside opportunity in terms of what your gain is, the beta being essentially what's your risk tolerance and, and what that potential volatility is. Like, yeah, you can have that high upside, but if you've got so much risk in, embedded in what you're doing as an operation and it all takes is like, you know, getting a flood or something or, you know, some sort of illness like hurting some of your animals, like yeah. that could wipe you out. Like, it's one thing to take a financial hit where you have a bad year. It's another where you're so over levered or, or you, you put out so much that you're not going to be able to make your mortgage payment. Like you've got to like, think about how do you contain and manage that risk and only sort of wait in, which has definitely been, at least for me, as I've, I've thought about the farm, how I mm -hmm. always started where it's like, you know, raising ducks in year one, it was like an outlay of a couple hundred bucks. And it's like, if I did that, well, you know, I guess we're not going away for a weekend. Like, you know, it's like, it's not the end of the world. Um, but, you know, like the cattle thing, I, it took me a couple of years to say, hey, am I comfortable in making this investment? And like saying, you know, could I put out $20,000 and maybe even not get there? Like, like that's that's part of the trade off. And that's part of the the like you almost have to be ready for it versus like diving right in to your point earlier. So circling back to breeders versus all in, all out, because I've done both, both for chickens and for pigs. I uh, haven't had cows on my farm because I was never prepared with having the brewery coinciding with the farm, I was never prepared for that long-term investment of the cows because I was the one, the main one person doing the farm, right? So I just wasn't ready, despite my my deep love for all the bovines. And uh, with chickens, we'll, we'll start with chickens. Um, 
there's it's if you're breeding birds and keeping them through the winter and then hatching if you're you ha you have to decide what operation you're in because when you get into this for a professional farming standpoint breeding your own chickens raising uh baby chicks and then having a laying flock is a lot to take on people who are so so you're i would split that in two is the first easiest cut Either you're a breeder who raised started pullets and you're selling live birds or hatching eggs, or you are raising them for egg production. Because if you're raising them for egg production, it doesn't make sense if you're at a scale under, I don't know, we'll say 5,000 birds to hatch your own birds out and take on the risk of the management of raising those birds from day one to 16 weeks uh, till they're ready to lay. You outsource that risk and that cost to somebody who's better at managing young birds than you do, and you're buying production birds from a another farm, and there's people who do this uh, with beautiful birds, and they're not just like the Cornish cross of egg layers, and they're, uh, you're getting mangled factory birds into your farm. Like there's, there's, there's a growing market for people who, are, who have really nice pullets. But it, it will probably cost you $15 to raise a pullet, 15 to $25 to raise a pullet on your own, where I can buy them for $9.50. And the, the unit economics for fl flipping my flock is a lot nicer at $9.50 than it is at $25 if I did it myself. Completely. And, and, and I think this is actually sort of an interesting thing that, that a lot of folks, when they kind of first go into this, they just make the assumption, oh, it's, it's better for me to do it all. But if you look at called the factory farming industry, right, the reason so many of those stages are broken into different parts is, number one, it's a different skill set required to do those different things. Mm -hmm. brooding, brooding chicks or hatching chicks is a whole different skill set versus, you know, growing them out or just managing a laying flock and handling collection and egg processing. Like, they're just such different activities. And, and so... I, I think that that totally makes sense, and particularly with things like chickens, there's so much, um, there's so much, so many people out there for it that it makes sense. I think here's where I've actually found slightly differing on that is with geese, where oh, there yeah. is such there is such a limited market of people actually raising geese in general. The price of goslings is so high relative to what you can do if you're raising them for meat. And, and like, what I've found is like, because it's a specialty thing, you can find ways to play in different parts of the business. So where it's like in the early, like kind of, you know, the geese usually start laying in February. I'm yep. not going to try to hatch goslings in Northern Vermont in February. It just doesn't make any sense. And so I'm usually selling those as fertilized eggs in the early months then. And then when it gets to be like May, that's when I do my own hatching. And so in May and June, I have goslings that I'm selling to people. But then when I get to the end of the year, anybody who didn't sell, I'm basically processing and that becomes a meat bird. And so it is sort of a cradle to grave thing, but I think that only works in a specialty situation. I don't think it works nearly as well with ducks and I don't think it works at all when it comes to chickens. And it's for, for those exact reasons that you laid out there. Well, and on a production side too. So we, then we get into breed. So it's not just operation. If you're, are you breeding and raising, or are you an egg laying operation? In an egg laying operation, you're going to want a production breed that produces anywhere from 280 to 325 eggs a year, versus a more heritage dual purpose breed that will do 200 to 250 eggs a year. It's a big difference. Yeah. And for people who don't know the difference in poultry feed when chicken feed is just feed that you get at tractor supply if you're feeding egg layer feed that is meant for a chicken that is laying eggs to a, a chicken that someday will lay an egg but it's growing up there's too much calcium in there and they get calcium deposits all over their organs and it will forever stunt the number of eggs that they can produce on it you can do everything else right but if you don't get your feeding regimen right they're bones will grow weird and their organs will calcify and everything is just tighter and bonier and that they can't produce as many eggs, which means your overall productivity over the next two years of your flock is going to be decreased just because of your feed choice. And you work different times of year, different temperatures, different types of flocks, 
different availability to forage and activity will all affect what you feed them. And unless you have that, if you know what you're talking about and you have a relationship, you're lucky enough to have a relationship with a feed mill and you know what the scale of your flock is and how much they're going to eat on a day-to-day basis so that you're not bulking up on feed because feed goes stale after 14 days after processing and it develops, can develop a mold and mycotoxin, which is another thing that gets into the, you know, into your small intestine and it affects the lay rate of your birds and yada, yada, yada. There's so many details and you circle all that back to beautifully Morgan started smaller and he's learning all these things and he's gathering the information and he's interviewing people so that if he wants to scale, he'll be well-prepared. You'll be well-prepared. And I'm talking about you in like third person. Uh, yeah, I was like, it was a little awkward. Yeah. It was a little weird. Um, <laughs> if, uh, um, and if you choose not to, you're going to have the best managed small flock in the Northeast. It's going to be great. Yeah, no, I, I think that that makes sense. And, and for folks who aren't aware of this, I think well, it, was, it was about two years ago, we did a little, or I did a little experiment and you helped me out where, you know, that breed of bird, that matters as well in terms of how you're thinking about like meat production, where what I did was I hatched out a whole bunch of, you know, essentially dual, dual breed, dual, dual purpose heritage breed birds here yep. on the farm. And I raised all the roosters and, and hens together. And the idea was I was going to call all the roosters or, or cockerel chicks and put those in the freezer and the hens would become like my next generation of laying flock. Yep. What I found is when I compared kind of from a dollar to dollar perspective, even without having to like basically take the cost of buying the chick that you would yeah. if you were doing like broilers, it doesn't even compare relatively speaking from an efficiency and cost standpoint um, in terms of what you get production wise. And like, you know, if you if I was raising those birds commercially, I was just raising them for our freezer. So it didn't really matter. But if I was raising them yeah, commercially, yeah. I would have lost a lot of money versus just going with Cornish cross chicks doing them for eight weeks, buying the chicks and like doing the standard way of just, you know, people, the way people t- typically raise broilers. And and so, yeah, like that will affect how things perform for you too. And so, you know, so much of farming is a, is a game of inches. And like, if you can w- win a little inch here, win a little inch here, win a little inch here, that might add up to be a foot. And that's actually going to be like, kind of keep you going versus, you know, losing an inch here, there, or there, that could put you right under. And so it doesn't take much to to flip that ratio. Right. And that doesn't mean you have to go with a factory farm breed like the Cornish Cross. You can raise a Freedom Ranger or whatever variety of Freedom Ranger might be local to you. But that's still a, a bloodline a breed that has been adapted for putting meat on its frame. It's going to have a different meat quality than the Cornish Cross, and that's fine. Uh, it might take a little longer. Also fine, 11 weeks versus seven weeks. Um, but you don't have to, you know, sell your soul to go to the Cornish cross. I still raise Cornish cross so that they're, that's fine with me. Um, but it's a, it's what my customers come to expect. So I raise a factory bird in a healthy way and I meet the customer where the market is right now for my area. Um, you know, kind of in that midpoint. Yeah. So, so John, when you're thinking about farm businesses and you're thinking about that investment of infrastructure, like, is there a thought process that you typically use in terms of saying, you know, here's how much would be fair to sink into a business. Here's how, how I should be thinking about kind of payback. And like, what does that window ultimately look like kind of from your perspective? Yeah, for sure. These are, these are the most fun exercises on the farm. When you're sitting down in the winter, you've gone through another year, you have a fresh data set in front of you. It gives you the questions to ask. So that you've, you've been collecting, anytime you do something on farm, you buy feed, you move something, you purchase something, a tractor supply, and you hammer it into the ground on the farm, saving all those receipts and allocating it to your different enterprises is very important because then you're going to get to the end of the year and say, well, 50 chickens was great. I want to do 500 chickens or, you know, go to 150 first. How much did it cost you to get started? What did you get out of it? And again, how much risk can you take? How, how big can you go? How fast? shoestring as much as possible, as long as possible, because it's going to teach you to be scrappy. It's going to teach you to appreciate when you get something nice, you know, and it's okay if people have things that are nice because you, you balance out what are, what does the land need so that I'm not degrading the land. I'm building more into the soil. What do the animals or the plants need so that they can live their best lives so that I can eat them in my face and have it be delicious. 
And then what do I need to want to get up in the morning and do this again? And you'll ask yourself those things as you're looking at scaling chickens, scaling pigs, scaling whatever. What do I need to make everybody happy? What's the win, win, win in this situation? And you start to lay it out. And then you lay out a fencing plan and you go, man, that fencing is so many dollars per foot. <laughs> what are my other options? And you do a cost benefit analysis, which sounds fancy, but it's just what can I afford and what am I going to get out of it? And mm -hmm. you'll go with a cheaper fencing, knowing that you may have more time getting animals back from breaking through that fence uh, or adjusting to learning what are, you know, what are the weak points in it so you can kind of plan ahead. And uh, building in the efficiencies of uh, production so that you are creating things that are nutritious and fulfilling, um, but also efficiencies where it is, doesn't take you as much time to do something. Sometimes there's expenses that you may not get more chicken out of it, but you will get less shoulder pain out of it. And if you want to wake up and do it next year, you're going to need those shoulders if you're doing poultry. And it makes sense not to lift things up with your arms all the time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because, yeah, the human body is like another one of those pieces of infrastructure that, you know, depreciates over time. <laughs> <laughs> it is a finite resource. We think young John thought that, uh, yeah, I just keep doing this forever. And then, you know, however many years later, I'm like, this left shoulder is really not a happy shoulder these days. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. You know, it, it's funny you should also mention sort of the, the wintertime conversations and the value of having that data and being able to say, hey, I should do this or that. Like where I was kind of alluding to earlier, of, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to be raising some, you know, feeder pigs to sell to folks over the course of, of next year. You know, the other thing I had been considering was adding sheep into the mix on the farm. And, yeah. and the reason I was like thinking of adding sheep was, well, I still have so much grass. And if I was going to criticize anything with my grazing activities this year is I had way more grass than I had animal. And so how do I bring that ratio up was like one of the things that I was think saying, how do I improve? But when I did the business case, and it's basically a mini version of what I did for my cattle, you know, it was going to take me like four years if everything went right to like really like make good on that business case. And even then it's like a whole nother set of work that's entirely different than everything else I'm doing with all the other animals versus I compared that to the business case that I had for the pigs where it was like, oh, I would be making money in year one and I could keep doing that same thing over and over again. And it's just a matter of finding enough customers, you know, doing the basics around raising the animals right and you know, securing like bonus sources of feed to help bring my, my costs down, which will improve, improve profitability. If I can just do those things, this will be a good business. And like, if I didn't have that data and if I hadn't done either of those forms of analysis, I think I'd probably still be leaning towards sheep, which, you know, looking at it right now seems like a poor choice kind of from a farm business perspective. Um, every sheep farmer I have talked to, and I will put myself in this group, is that they had two of their favorite days on farm, whereas the day they got their sheep and the day they got rid of their sheep, <laughs> you know, I will, I will, if I may it's, give uh, a yeah. plug, give a plug to, uh, I forget her name. There's a, there's a woman on, on YouTube, the shepherdess, great sheep information. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you're, if you're doing sheep research, the shepherdess, her content is entertaining and she knows her stuff. And, and another good example of somebody who is a young entrepreneur who is going out and media is part of her mix where she has the on-farm, off-farm job of uh, what she's doing with her content. She published a book. And I would say she's no less a farmer than any farmer I know um, because just like you and me, we have other sources of income. I think it's great. And, and um you know, I think the other thing too that that, that is interesting and, and like, yeah, the shepherdess is, I think she's a good example. It's like where I think it's much easier to manage your farm business when you're very data driven, which, you know, is not something I think a lot of folks have as the stereotype for a good successful farm, but like tracking that information and keeping tabs on it and then knowing what works and what doesn't. And then how do you evolve and improve? Like it's, I, I think that that's a really other like important skill that exists there. Which is funny that you reached out to me for this episode and that I would be considered a data guy or data person because I have an art degree. I like to make beautiful things. I don't do spreadsheets and numbers. I like, 
it is the most challenging obstacle that I have faced throughout this entire journey. It's not who I am naturally. It is, I want to take pictures and tell stories and make people feel things. It is my creative expression. Even on the educational YouTube videos, I think about those so much. That's why I, I produce one video every six months. It's because I, I plan it out so much and I'm, I'm, I'm trying new things. And I I'm always have a second conversation in my head of there's one going what's in the microphone and then there's which way is my head facing? Is the lighting right? Am I gesturing too much with my hands? I don't care about the data until I had to really like you have to. And so the thing you work the hardest that you become really good at because it was a struggle. Some people, well, they can do it, comes naturally. Great, wonderful. I've had to, it's been a chore and it's been an uphill battle. I spent time, I've watched so many tutorials on V lookups and X lookups and data management and pulling out register of accounts and then sorting it from there and creating pivot tables. And now all that stuff is almost second nature. Um, but yeah, I had to like relearn generic algebra uh, once I got into this because I, I was an artist. I have an art, I don't and I worked in theater and TV. But honestly, man, that's exactly why I did reach out. Because, they, I mean, in all seriousness, like, look, uh, yeah, as a fellow, you know, art school, you know, kind of graduate, um, it doesn't come naturally to you. But, like, I found, like, when I was working, like, you know, kind of like business world prior to, to making the shift to the farm, like, I had to, like, really push myself to learn those things as well. And it was something I could bring to managing the farm. Um, but like, I think there's a lot of stereotypes that folks have where it's like, oh, numbers people or people who are kind of like financially minded in terms of thinking about their farm operation are naturally that way. And it, it, I think exactly to what you said, it's usually the exact opposite. And it's, you have this weakness that you need to like almost overcompensate for to ultimately find your way to like getting there and making it something that will help keep you afloat. And that's, that's made me better at teaching it to people because I understand your discomfort, <laughs> you know. I know how much you don't want to do it, but I also know of the operations that you have on your farm, managing your information is the most critical. That's the thing that, that's your path to viability. Before you even start farming, do you know what it costs to live every month? Do you have any idea how much you spend on groceries? Like if you don't have a personal family budget, I wouldn't start a business. Cause you don't know how to track information. You have information. Every person listening to this has information in front of them right now has used a debit or credit card and has to balance things, aspirational goals, going to Disneyland, whatever, uh, versus the reality of like, do I buy these eggs or those eggs? Because that those are more expensive and I'm balancing out my food bill this week. Uh, cause the car broke down and I have to fix that. Like all of the, the drudgery, that you will face with financials and data tracking and farming already exist in your life. You just write agriculture in front of it and then it gets a little harder. So, so John, now, you know, coming back to kind of my farm and as I'm looking at 2024, what would be the things in your opinion I should focus in on more? What should I be doing differently? What should I be changing to make next year even better than this year? Uh, put a cot in your new barn for me to come visit. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you're off to, you're off to an amazing start. Um, and the fact that you track this much and you can analyze and say, I don't want sheep. You're already leaps in front of so many people. And that is such a wonderful thing. Tightening up the two of the things that I see on a regular basis. If with, uh, pigs and chickens, especially, but with cattle as well, feed is the biggest expense and cattle. You don't think about it. Grass fed cattle that, you know, feed is the biggest expense, but managing your grass and the nutrition of your grass and your hay and calculating out your dry matter equivalents. Those are big things. Figuring out your, your feed supply, when to feed, and then feed delivery systems where one of my pet peeves on the internet is when I see people pouring their chicken feed out on the ground because there are fines in that chicken feed that you want that chicken to eat all the way to the bottom of the feeder because they're going to get those minerals and other micronutrients that, you know, it's the uh, poultry neutral balancer that is going to help compete, complete their food 
their nutrition uh, for their body to grow most effectively. And if you're effectively managing your feed, not only when you get it, so it's not stale, uh, how long you keep it and where you keep it, and then how you feed it out so that the bird is getting their most efficient bunch of nutrients. Because chickens will only eat for their energy needs, not for their nutrition needs. So they will eat more in the winter and less in the summer. And if they're not eating to the bottom of that feeder, all those beautiful little finds um, are sinking to the bottom and the birds are not getting it. For cattle, when you move them onto new pasture, when you move them off, how long you let it rest, older grass, if you think about it, when grass is young and it's got that nice big blade, it's high in protein. You're raising meat cattle, you want them high in protein. If you let that grass get long, then there's more fiber in it because that fiber is going to create the stalk that holds that solar panel up in the wind as that grass blows around. So when your animals are on what piece of grass and what is the mix of that grass, you'll be able to manage it so you'll get longer days where you need less feed input over the winter with buying round bales. Because cows will go and they'll, turn, they'll kick up snow and you can do stockpile grazing and extend your grazing season and buy in less hay. So I, I would say this for just about anybody, and it rings true for you too, kind of taking a year and concentrating, like stay, if you can, stay a similar size, but focus on nutrition. And because that's your biggest input, that's what your animals are eating so that then you eat them. Pay, pay attention to that because you'll find so many efficiencies in that. And sometimes you can't get better feed. And that's just a known now, but you know that in the future, if you come across it, the light bulb will go off and you'll capitalize on that opportunity. Yeah, I, th I think that that makes a lot of sense. And and I, I do know that that's, you know, like I said earlier, I, I know my biggest grazing problem was I had more grass than animal. And mm. so like the first couple of months, I was like right along and I was like on this planned like 60 or 65 day, you know, rest cycle for the land. And it was like just right. But what I was finding is exactly what you're saying. When I fell behind and I was like 70 days behind or 80 days behind, it started to grow so high that it was like they didn't like it as much. They weren't eating it as aggressively. And I think they had to eat more of it because it was just less nutritious. And so I do know that that's, that's definitely an area for improvement for next year. Well, and then even that, there's variables. It's not a hard, a hard set rule where in the spring when your grass is growing like crazy, it's a 30-day rest period. In the middle of summer, it's a 45-day rest period. And then at the end of the summer, when the grass is getting tired and the days are getting shorter, uh, it's a 60-day rest period. And all of that can be very challenging to work out, especially in the beginning. But it's one of those things that you you do it. And then the most important task, and this is when I do my record keeping, this is when I take my, my pictures, do all the busy stuff. Get everything done. Cows move, chickens fed, and then you do your linger grazing. You stop and you observe. It's part of the scientific method. What are the little things and how are they affecting the big things? And then what actions can you take? What bite out of the elephant can you take to optimize for happiness? And goes back to happiness for the soil, for the animal, and for the person. What are those little things? But it's it's those moments of zen. Because, you know, it's, it can be hard for the average person, not Morgan, he's a superhero, um, to, to stop and take pictures while you're doing chores. Do all the busy stuff first. Make it look beautiful. And then take your marketing photographs. Write down what you did take some pictures. And when you stop and you observe your birds, you'll see, oh, that feeder's too high. That feeder's too low. Their feed's getting wet. They're on top of each other because I don't have enough linear space. And now my birds are getting scratched. You know, like all these little things. But if you don't stop and observe, that's where the magic and farming happens for me in those linger grazing moments where you're just sitting there. You know, sometimes you just sit and watch. And that's one of the most efficient things you can do. It doesn't feel like it because you're sitting there you know, sitting on your hands. But if you're actively observing, that's where the magic's going to happen. And that's how, you know, that's what makes sense of all the spreadsheets later on. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of the Goldshaw Farm podcast. Once again, I want to say thank you to my buddy, John Siskovich, for calling in and having that conversation with me. I think it's always nice to talk kind of farm business with somebody. And John is just such a smart farm business and farm marketing guy that, yeah, I, I just love chatting with him when it comes to that stuff. And if you guys are actually curious, you should check out his website, Farm Marketing Solutions. I'll leave a link for it in the show notes or video description. And, you know, you can find a lot of his books, The Pastured Poultry Pro uh, 
the pa- the pasture poultry packet that he's produced, which is like so worth the money if you're ever planning on raising meat chickens um, or even just really a lot of other farm businesses. It's super, super useful. And as I've said, it's something I've used over the years to help with my farm business planning, even if I'm not doing like, say, chickens for meat. So definitely check that out. You can also actually even hire John as a consultant. Quite honestly, having just like a one hour consulting conversation with John, if you're ever thinking about starting a farm business, is totally worth what you would spend to do that because the value he's going to provide you and how he's going to help you think about some of this stuff is is totally worth it in my mind. Now, just a quick programming note. This is actually the last Goldshaw Farm podcast episode of this year. And actually, we will be back in January, but the name of the podcast is going to be changing. Stories Told with Morgan Gold. Ever since I resurrected the podcast back in 2023, like, or middle of 2023, um, I've been toying with, you know, changing up the format, changing up the approach, changing how things are going. And so the last couple of months, this has actually been very much me experimenting with things. I've enjoyed this experiment but also recognize that kind of the moniker of the old podcast isn't the same, neither is like kind of what you get out of it. And so I'm going to be changing it. If you're listening to us in the audio uh, audio feed version, don't worry, nothing's going to change. You just might see some different artwork. If you're listening on YouTube, you probably are going to need to find us on a different channel because we're going to be leaving the Goldshaw Farm YouTube channel and going elsewhere. Um, there might be some announcements about that uh, early next year, but stay tuned. And so with that, Teeny Barncat just came up here and joined me on my shoulder again. I wish you guys a happy and healthy holiday season and hope you have a wonderful new year. And I'll be back in January, and so will Ginny Barncat. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to a lot of big things for us and our farm in 2024. Thanks for listening, everybody. It's got a soul, this here old farm. It falls asleep inside my arms. We walk the fields. Under the stars, the love is here, Goldshaw Farm.